Okay, next section, or next bu bunch of books. John Kenneth Galbraith's The Affluent Society. I don't know anything about this, other than it's, uh, he's an e uh, economist, so we'll find out what it's about when I read it. Next book, A Short History of Africa, by Oliver and F uh, Fage? F Fage? I don't know. I guess I should be doing the years. It would be uh, proper, I think. Uh, this is, whoa, first published 62, this one's 84. I read another book on Africa, and that should be in another pile, so I'll get to that one. It's a yellow cover. Um, it was actually really neat, um, so I picked up another book about Africa. History of the World by Roberts. Um, I thought I might as well have it. It has a lot of actually uh, nice sections. This is published in... 92, although, oh, 95. First published in 76, yes. So it's got uh, beginnings, first civilizations, classical Mediterranean, age of diverging traditions, the making of the European age, the great acceleration, the end of the Europeans' world, and the, light, the latest age. Um, so, yes. I thought that was good. So this is not necessarily a book you would read the whole thing. If you're reading about medieval history, and then uh, you'll just read a chapter of that. The Unconscious Civilization by John Ralston Saul. I think the back was intriguing, so that's why I bought it. Um, something about con uh, knowledge is not conscious. It says here that our society is superficially based on the individual and democracy. Increasingly, it is conformist and corporatist, a society in which legitimacy lies with specialist or interest groups, and decisions are made through constant negotiations between these groups. Yes, I agree, certainly. Uh, lobby groups and special interest groups are, are taking over a lot of democracy. This is 1995-1997. So, I think that's a Canadian... Maybe. Not that it really matters. Oh, here it is. So here's the African book I was talking about. Ancient African Kingdoms by Sh uh, Shiny, Margaret Shiny. Um, this was printed in 65. Uh, so I, this was great. Um, it talks about the Kush, the Kushians or something like that. It talks about the Egyptians. And then it goes into, uh, they get wiped out by, I think it was the Kushians. talks about the Ghana Empire, the Mali Empire, the Songhai Empire, the Kanem-Burnu Empire. That it doesn't call them empires, I'm just calling them that. And I thought it was really neat because it talks a lot about trade with the Africans. It says that uh, a lot of the information they have about Africa is from the Arab states. Because the Africans did not have... Um, they didn't write anything down um, for a long time. So, um, a lot of information we know about Africa, other than from archaeology, comes from um, the Arabs. So, but it talks a lot about trade. Actually, I think it was the Mali, um, they mined gold and traded gold sometimes per pound for salt like the same proportion, a pound of salt for a pound of gold. They didn't need the damn stuff, they needed salt. So the salt was a luxury for them. So I thought that was uh, fascinating about Africa. The Medieval Economy and Society by uh, Postin, Volume 1. So this is about, so I have an interest in economics, especially I have an interest in in uh, historical economics, or uh, maybe historical commerce would be a better way to put it. Um, I'm very interested in how trade was handled by, uh, in history, what nations traded, what kinds of things, and so that's why I picked up this one, Medieval Economy and Society. I also have, I don't think I've ever shown it, I might have shown it in the other videos, but I also have two books from the library, I don't own them on the, um, oh no, 
It is on a trade a trade league. Hans, the Hansian trade Hansiatic uh, league that is it's out of Germany um, in the Middle Ages or in the Renaissance era, I should say. Um, the trade in the not the Mediterranean um, above that. What is that area called? I don't don't know now. Above Europe, uh, below Norway, Sweden, and all that, all that area, all the trade that went along there from Novgorod over to uh, Edinburgh, London, all of that. Um, so kind of like a patrician. If you play patrician, that map is essentially a Hanseatic league map, and I've been very interested in uh, the practices of trade. And it talks a lot about Norway, and or it talks a lot about Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, Finland. Um, because the land is not very good up there for farming, they import a lot of grain and export fish and leather and furs and stuff like that. And so it's very interesting, uh, that trading arrangements that occurred between those two countries. So, yes, here is David Copperfield's... Er, Charles Dickens, David Copperfield, it's just fiction. Picked it up because it was cheap. Don't know when I'll read it. Um, I probably, I prefer nonfiction because I think it's more worthwhile. But I think that there are some fictions that are worth reading. I was reading Anna Karenna, which I'll get to, by Tolstoy. And I had to put it down. I got about a third of the way through it. And... It wasn't very worthwhile so far. Um, reminds me of something that Mr. Cropper said about fiction, that it's like watching... It can be like watching TV, as in you just sit there and uh, you don't have to think very much. You just... And Anna Karenna was getting that way for me. It was just a story, you read the story, and you just see what's happening next, and it was no, there was no thinking involved, so I put it down. Okay, I got this one recently in the mail. The writings of William James. So he's a psychologist, and I dabble in psychology uh, with the subject of education. I'm in education as my research, and so I dabble in psychology. And so I thought I should have something on. I should have a nice. This is a comprehensive edition. This is by uh, McDermott. I thought I should have a a, a tome uh, on William James. This is seventy seven. University of Chicago. So I have it. So now if I need it, I have it. So I, I should mention, um, you don't always need to have books because you're going to read them right away. Sometimes it's necessary to have a book because you may need it later. So you don't have to, um, don't have to uh, read everything you have. Sometimes it's for later. It's for the future. This book I picked up from my library, they were dumping stuff, and I picked this up. The Child in Crisis, this is a, um, it's got a series of write, uh, essays in it. Uh, this is by Doyle and uh, uh, Behrens, B-E-H-R-E-N-S. This is 86. Um, so this has got just um, a whole bunch of different stuff in it. It says, uh, Wanting to Die... These are all crises. Wanting to die, failing in school, mystery illness, trouble with sex, abusing drugs, trouble at the dinner table, accidental living, leaving home, child of divorce, sexual abuse, growing up. So, and it's very, um, it's written, uh, I don't want to say written very nicely. That's not what I mean. It's um, almost like a story, but it's talking about real world issues, and I thought it, well, it was free. I thought, well, yeah, I'll have that. I'll take it. Okay, here's another uh, commerce book. A, conc a Concise History of Business in Canada. Uh, this is by Taylor and Baskerville. Oxford University Press, um, 1994. So I thought the titles for this were just great, or the, or the uh, chapter sections. So it says here, uh, Business Practice in North America and Europe at the Time of Contact, so New World, right? The Case of Fur, 
Um, the Fur Frontier. Merchants, craft producers, peasant farmers. Colonial capitalism in transition. Um, yes. I just thought this was great. Um, what else? Farm, factory, and finance. Lower Canada, Quebec. The age of the activist state. This is the early 20th century now. Or maybe the mid. So, yeah, I thought that was well, it's perfect. Got to have that. Okay, here's another commerce book. Economic History of Europe. I think I paid eight bucks for this. Yeah. Or I might have gotten it. I think I had there was a sale on. I think it was 60% off or something like that. So then I, I went to town a little bit. Third edition by Clow and Cole. Uh, 1968, first printed 52. Um, a society based on manners. Industry based on crafts. Commerce based on towns. The beginnings of capitalism. Expansion of Europe. Expanding capitalism. Mercantilism. Etc. 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 Yeah. So this was oh it's got canals too canals railways very good very good yes first world war was in there too okay this is another book that I picked up from the library because it was free it is called got some pictures in here it is called it's about archaeology the morning of mankind, prehistoric man in Europe. Uh, Robert Silverberg. This is sixty-seven. So it's just um, it's archaeology. I think there's probably pictures throughout. Yeah, maps and so it's about the beginnings of the species. So. I thought that was worth well, zero. Oh, I thought that was worth picking up. Okay, here's a fiction book, Moonfleet. I read this in elementary school, and I saw it there, and I had to have it. Only a couple bucks, two bucks. Moonfleet. This is about um, prohibition, drug running, or I mean alcohol, or bootlegging, I should say, bootlegging, which means alcohol um, smuggling. This is by Faulkner. This was printed in 63, reprinted in 70. But yeah, I had to have it. I have to have a... I, and I should read it again, too. Some of the pages I, I notice, even in the other books, too, they're cut at the bottom. Sometimes even the, the front few pages are cut in the bottom. I'm not sure why, if maybe there was, like, defamatory language or something, and so they just kind of cut the whole page out, or, I don't really know, but it's, I'm seeing it more commonly than I would attribute randomness to, so I just wonder if there's a purpose to that madness. Thinking Straight, Principles of Reasoning for Readers and Writers, this is by Beardsley, um, get the year for you here, so this is just, I think it might Maybe learn something from it. This is 75, first printed in 50. So, I figured maybe I'd learn something about reasoning in here. Always could it be, uh, always could learn something about that, statements and arguments. I was reading from school a book on reasoning, and it mentioned that the P and the, often logic is P and Q stuff, truth tables and all that. It said that for everyday arguments, the P and Q stuff is not very useful. So it broke it down into common language, talking about inferences and all that kind of stuff, and and um, uh, what was it called? You can draw, you can look at an argument and you can draw it out. So there's certain premises that have to follow from an argument, and then that argument leads to an, a conclusion. There was different of uh, terms though than that. Um, the premises was in there, but there was other, they used other terms, but essentially meant like your argument, your conclusion. The argument, I guess, is the whole thing. Premises attached to something, and then that leads to something. I can't remember now. Here's another one for the library, which was free. 
Canada and the United Nations, 45 to 75. I thought that might be interesting to flip through. Um, what does, like, does, has Canada had any impact on the United Nations, really? We're not even in this, I, I think we got kicked out of the Security Council this year or something, not that I care about that, but I thought, you know, I don't know, maybe there'll be something in here that's interesting. I flipped through it. What, what does Canada possibly have to do with the United Nations? So, okay, that's, that's it for that group. I've got maybe four more to, no, maybe three, four, probably four more videos, four more of these.